Hi everyone, so let me get started by who I am because this is my first LPC and I don't know, I guess uh, only those who went to Fossa may know me or not. I've been working on TPMs on and off for like 13 years now, which is uh, kind of a long time, I guess. Um, and actually the working on TPM 1.2 and the TSS 1.2 was what got this whole interest of mine in the TSS and the new API for TPM 2 started. So yeah, other than that, I work for Fraunhofer's IT, working on trustworthy platforms. I'm also a TCG member, so I'm specifying this whole API stuff in the, in the working group there. And I'm the maintainer of the TPM2 TSS, which is the core library, the TPM2 TSS engine, and TPM2 TOTP, which is a port of what Matthew Garrett introduced like three or four years ago um, over to TPM2.0, if any of you ever noticed that thing. But um, let's, let's take a slower start. So what are we actually talking about? We're talking uh, in terms of hardware. So there is this TPM, Trusted, Computer, uh, Trusted Platform Module, which is um, a smart card-like thing on your laptops, on your desktops, on your I don't know what. Um, and it has a lot of smart card-like capabilities in terms of using and storing keys and being a secure environment for you to handle your keys. It also has these remote attestation capabilities that Matthew talked about yesterday that um, actually I'm not gonna touch uh, at all in this talk because I wanna go for the, like the low hanging fruits, um, the stuff that's easily usable without too much infrastructure. Um, TPMs, there's a lot of misconceptions as there always is. So TPMs oftentimes come as a separate chip, which um, I don't know by some of the hardware TPM vendors which are either connected via LPC, which was mostly from the 1.2 days. Nowadays, you mostly have SPI connected uh, chips, or there's also a specification for I2C connected chips uh, for the embedded area where you don't have enough SPI left. Um, on some platforms, it's implemented in firmware in what I still refer to as the South Bridge. I don't know what you call it nowadays, but it's like the other thing. Um, <laughs> Um, you have implementations in TEEs, aka Trust Zone or whatever. Um, I know that on some, some mobile devices there exists or existed versions of TPMs that people put in there. And thanks to Microsoft and thanks to the Windows Logo program, we have them in every PC nowadays. So um, it's just there, it's sitting there and we should make use of it. Now. Besides the TPM itself, there's of course the CPU, where the OS lives, where the TSS lives, and where all the fun is, at least um, as much as I'm concerned, because I don't, I don't implement TPMs, thankfully. So what is the TPM software stack? So the kernel has a driver for TPM. It has had one for a very long time, and um, the kernel exposes dev TPM zero, or nowadays dev TPM RM zero, but the thing that you can do with this device is you can send a byte buffer and you get back a byte buffer. It's marshaled data of TPM commands and TPM responses and well, you have to interpret them yourselves unless of course you use something like a, a TSS. So you can think of the, the, the open source implementation of the TSS as something like the MESA for, or MESA, I don't know how you pronounce it, for TCG specifications. If you think of OpenGL, um, the TCG specifications, the TPM defines the functionality for the hardware, the TSS defines a software API for this functionality, and then the TPM2 TSS project and its uh, libraries implement the glue code. So um, the, 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 the equivalent to like an OpenGL support in GDK, Godot, or Wayland would be, we put stuff into OpenSSL, we put stuff into PKCS11, we put stuff into Crypt Setup. So this is why it's like one of the, the core things or core security features that you wanna get. Um, so this is the stack more graphically this time. Um, as I already mentioned, there is uh, at the bottom, we have the device driver. Um, we have resource managers. There's one living in the kernel. Uh, there's one living in uh, another project in for user space, which uh, has a few more capabilities. Um, then there is the TCTI, which is an abstraction layer for inter-process communication. And so the idea here is that at runtime you can choose whether you wanna um, talk to the TPM 
either via the resource manager if you're on a fully loaded operating system or if you're still in initRD, you can run the same tool and just at runtime choose a different TCTI module in order to talk to DevTTM0 or you can have a very different TCTI module that talks to a simulator. So it's all interchangeable at runtime. That's the, the only purpose that you need to memorize for what the TCTI is. And uh, recently we, uh, we gained a library that makes loading those uh, much easier, thanks to Phil. Um, the three main APIs that you um, might be using or hopefully will be using would be the system API, the enhanced system API, and what we call the feature API. And I'm sorry for the horrible naming, but uh, that's backworking and specification groups. Um, so the system API is something that's very, very low level, uh, gives you like full control and has basically no requirements against any um, backing libraries or any backing, even not even a memory allocation mechanism is completely um, caller allocated. So that's something you wanna use if you're on UEFI or if you're run the writing firmware for a very, very small microcontroller. But other than that, you probably don't wanna concern yourself with that API. The other two ones are much more interesting. So the ESYS um, API gives you a nice interface for one-to-one -one mapping to TTM commands. Um, and in the background for you, it does a lot of the session handling. So when you talk to a TTM, you have um, cryptographic sessions that enable you to do HMAC-based authentication instead of sending your passwords in the plane or to do um, parameter encryption between the CPU and the TPM or even over a network connection. So this is all done, like all this metadata handling is done by the, um, by the ESYS. And coming up, um, so coming up very soon hopefully, um, there is the feature API. There's already been a spec and draft form. Don't even look at it. Um, it's from, from what I heard, it's being completely reworked and um, this is gonna be implemented soon. And this is, gives you a very, very high level um, of talking to uh, the TPM where um, you have no custom type definitions anymore, but uh, like all the interfacing with the TPM is handled via um, JSON encoded parameter files. It provides a policy language, it provides an automatic key store, stuff like that. So that's a very, very convenient high level API. So this is all implemented. So all those APIs are or are going to be implemented in the TPM2 TSS project. That's the core libraries project. Um, and I heard recently that it's so, so hard to build our stuff and we have so many dependencies in order to build our stuff. So uh, just to debunk that, we're using auto tools, we're using PKG config, and we have one dependency which is either libcrypto or libgcrypt, you can decide your crypto backend yourself. So I think that's uh, reasonably easy uh, to just type make dash, uh, dash j. Um, coming up with the next um, API, we'll probably have to also include libcurl and libjsonc but I think uh, three dependencies are still easily manageable. Then we, uh, the, the, the second project is the TPM2 ABRMD. This is the user space resource manager. Again, two dependencies, easy to build. And um, another of the core projects would be the TPM2 tools, which is a, basically gives you command line control over the TPM. And we're just running through the release candidates of the 4.0 release. So we completely broke parameters in API but now it's better. Um, and again, it also has only two dependencies. And so for all these core projects, what we're trying to achieve is we're just trying to follow best practices. Um, we're targeting around 80% of test coverage. We have scan builds on every pull request. We have coverity for every release. CIA best practices, LGTM tells us we have good code, so machines say we're nice. Um, and actually now there is an effort going on to have a multi-distro CI on every pull request by uh, using Docker and Travis, which I found very intriguing and interesting. So I'm really looking forward to that being merged. Um, and of course, um, there's people, there's community, unique community. So this is the list of maintainers we currently have um, active on each of those core projects. I especially want to point out Elias, who is the first volunteer maintainer who's not being paid to work on this stuff. So that's pretty cool. Um, more than 100 contributors if we go through the Git logs and we're currently packaged for basically every uh, major distribution, not with the most recent version usually, except for Arch, I guess. Um, but still, um, to 
can basically apps get or DNS get us on every platform. Um, beyond like Linux distributions, um, we, uh, we even support Windows. So we have Visual Studio build files, if anybody is interested in that. I guess not. Um, <laughs> we have a patch. We have we have had patches for making us work on QNX weak works. Recently, we merged something to better integrate or better support FreeBSD. And I've seen a prototype of using SAPI in a stripped-down version on a micro on an Arduino microcontroller. So that's how low you can get with our stack. And um, like this is the the website that you want to. Keep in mind, um, this is our community website, whatever, where you find links to the mailing list, links to, I don't know, different talks, like the one I'm giving here will be linked, and hopefully in the future we will get some tutorials on there as well, um, or you send a pull request once you've figured your way through the stack. All right, um, but the thing I actually promised in the abstract when handing in this talk was to discuss different use cases. So that was the background of what we're talking about. This is how this is useful for core, core infrastructure, core system security features. Um, the very first and very, very much easiest uh, thing to do is you want to shield your keys when you store them and when you use them so that they don't leak. Um, keys and RAM are always a bad idea, just, well, hard bleep. Uh, keys on disk are just as dangerous because even though you can protect them with the user password, those passwords can be brute force or dictionary attacked. And especially when you look at servers or embedded devices, they don't have a step for having, I don't know, the admin go into the data center, approach each of the machines and type in some kind of password in order to unlock the keys to serve to the outside world. That doesn't make any sense. So you need some ways to, to prevent the uh, malicious copying of the URIDs or cloning. Um, and that's easy to be done using, just use the TPM for that. It's right there on the device already. Um, how do you do that? Um, might sound very complicated. Actually, it's not. Um, this is a project also uh, hosted on this, on this core libraries, um, GitHub namespace, uh, which is an open uh, SSL engine that basically, I don't know how many of you guys know how open SSL works. So they have this internal interface where you can, at runtime, load additional engines into the OpenSSL library that perform the cryptographic operations for OpenSSL. And so we wrote one of those libraries um, that uses, that then hands off the cryptographic operations to the TPM and spits the results back into OpenSSL. So this way, um, just by setting, what is it? the engine to TPM2 TSS and setting the key form to engine, which is two command line parameters, you already have all your keys coming from the TPM instead of your RAM, um, which prevents cloning of your identities already. So it's easy to integrate. Um, How would that compare performance-wise if the encryption is done not in the TPM, in open, on OpenSSL, I mean? That depends highly on the performance of your TPM. So there's TPMs ranging from, I guess, 300 milliseconds per signature down to 150 or 100 milliseconds, which is kind of slow. If you're in a virtual environment, I would maybe propose uh, exposing a virtual TPM to each of your virtual machines, and then you will get the whole um, software and CPU accelerated stuff um, in the virtual TPM on running on your DOM zero, if that's your concern. Well, it doesn't, so it doesn't, doesn't answer my question besides uh, your mileage might vary. And yeah, I know, I, I understand it might vary, but do I need to do my own benchmarks to get the ballpark figure whether it'll be slower or not? Um, well, it's definitely gonna be slower. There's no doubt about that. A hardware TPM is always slower, and even if you run like a virtual TPM in a cloud center, you have to do a bunch of uh, VT switching uh, in order to hand down the messages to the hypervisor VTPM and pass it back up, so you're always gonna be slower. The order of magnitude for VTPM, I don't know how long it takes. Uh, I guess, do we have a cloud track somewhere? Uh -huh. um, so that depends on how, how long it takes for uh, DOM U to DOM zero switching and back. 
but like for example when it was integrated into Apache 2 it only matters for the handshake and establishing the connection because the session key will be handled in memory and the session encryption is fast and accelerated with CPU instructions etc. Yeah, thank you. So you really want to only put your long-lived IDs into the PPM and uh, session secrets or session encryption is done on the fly. I'm going to challenge your assertion that this is easy with specifying the engine and the key form. You then have to get that into every single application in the system. No, you are not done until people can take the PEM file with the key wrapped keys and expect it to just work in all the applications. And we are fixing things like Fedora distribution guidelines to mm -hmm. state that if your application takes keys in a file, thou shalt also accept RFC um, 7518, PKCS 11 URIs, and thou shalt also accept the wrapped file and just do the right thing. So mm -hmm. don't stop there. Don't say it's easy. You are not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> I would never say so. And actually, there's going to be a slide a while, a while later. What I actually want to do right now is implement the EVPP key um, interfaces. There's a half done pull request that's been hanging around for quite some time. That will enable us to just load the key because then we auto detect the uh, private key, t uh, private TSS key uh, PEM header, um, which is the same header and actually the same data format as um, uh, James is using for his implementation. So we're even interchangeable between those two implementations. Yeah, that's definitely on the agenda. Um, I would love, uh, I will just skip ahead now. Uh, I'm still searching for a second main terminal to, um, with more open SSL knowledge to be able to review the EVPP key uh, implementation that's hanging around in the pull request because that's going a lot deeper into open SSL than what I've been doing so far and what I would be comfortable with. So if there's anybody who here who wants to maintain an open SSL engine, um, I'll be waiting right out the door. <laughs> hmm? Cool. Uh, just a, a comment on the speed issue. Uh, they're getting faster and they're getting faster pretty quickly. And we know how fast they're getting faster because the Windows logo spec has a table of requirements that are going to need to be met for compliance over time. And so you can literally just look up how fast they are. Cool. All right. Um, next use case, user authentication. Um, we probably all know the typical smart card workflow. You um, have PKC 11 modules for those. And um, the smart card is your proof of possession. Then you enter a pin into Firefox, Thunderbird, whatever. And um, that gives you a way to authenticate to, uh, to, a, to a web server. It's more secure and I guess more convenient than upcoming password policies. I think recently I've been up to 15 characters from three different number spaces and uh, whatever. So um, I actually prefer my four digit pins over that very, very much. So what's currently a work in progress is uh, another of those projects, which is the PKCS11 virtual smart card based on a TPM. And here the, the, the model shifts a little bit. So instead of having proof of possession by holding a smart card, you have proof of possession by holding your laptop, which is more or less the same thing, unless you, uh, as least, at least as long as you only have a class zero card reader, which like 99% of people have, I guess. <coughs> and proof of knowledge, you enter your PIN, and we are fully compatible. So uh, as soon as you do that, you well basically just install the PKCS11 driver and you're done. Again, it's very easy, <laughs> especially if you use, um, I think it's uh, the libpk11, was it called? Um, that gives you a way to work with multiple back-end PKCS11 providers because currently it's hard to have more than one installed and it gets kind of messy addressing them. So that's something that's being solved there. Um, and also it's easier to set up then. Um, more user authentication happens on, on VPNs. So um, typically you enter your username and your password, which is um, again a very long password and it's not too secure because well, if somebody just looks at your keyboard while you're typing stuff in, they can impersonate you and log into the same VPN as you did. It's 
happens especially uh, at conferences, I've been told, at security conferences. So people are switching over from passwords to fingerprints because that's more secure in practice, apparently, uh, even though the, then you have to always carry around your own glasses. Um, so in order to, uh, to get around that problem, again, you can, you can switch over from a username password-based approach to a machine and user password-based approach. Pretty similar to PKCS11. And that gives you a, a whole new level of um, security for network access. Um, actually, that's been done for OpenConnect by David Woodhouse. He basically just took the, the, the code from the OpenSSL engine, ported it over to his OpenConnect project, and now at least um, on this machine here, the OpenConnect is cooler than the original AnyConnect in that regard. Um, there's also been the implementation of, of StrongSwan, which is like the whole IPsec, uh, full-blown attestation kind of access. Um, and I'm hoping, I haven't tested it yet, that using the OpenSSL engine, we should also get OpenVPN working pretty nicely. What I would love to see, of course, would be like WireGuard, Tink, and whatnot to support uh, TPMs as well. Nico has now ported my OpenConnect code into a Jimmy VLS as well. So not most yet, but he's working on supporting some. Okay, I'll add that right to the slides. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, um, so th that much for user um, authentication. Disk encryption is another one of those core features that you want to have on your system or system security features. So what am I talking about? I don't know how many of you suffered through BitLocker, but wouldn't BitLocker for Linux be awesome? Um, what it gives you, it gives you a binding of the disk to the machine, which means that you cannot just remove the disk, put it into a different machine, and be able to directly access over there. Um, it gives you short bins instead of long passwords. Again, something that uh, I very much like for my convenience. And um, you don't run into the issue of dictionary attacks anymore. Um, no matter how nice your encryption is, there's always the, 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 you always have to basically add a character every two years according to Moore's law. And you don't want to do that forever because I hope to live for a few more years and so that my brain wouldn't handle that. Um, so what this means is we um, encrypt the disk and seal the key to the TPM. Um, this has even more utility in other areas than the desktop. If you think about the data center where currently or using just standard crypt setup and lux, people can basically go in and rip out hard disks and walk away with them and be able to access the data. If you're able to bind the disk cryptographically to the machine, people, can, uh, people would have to rip out the main board alongside with the disk. And the main board is a little harder to carry and easier to see that uh, somebody ripped out the main board because the machine is down. Um, Embedded devices, same story once again. Um, you want to be able to bind data from, I don't know, an SD card that's sitting in an external slot. I don't know if you've seen like this industrial grade equipment. They have this SD card slot and like everything is just on an SD or MMC card. You want to be able to bind this stuff to the machine so um, people can't just rip out the card while walking past the machine. And if you're really fancy, and this is the only time I think I'm going to touch attestation, you can even bind the encryption of your disk to the integrity status of your BIOS, uh, of your BIOS so, or UEFI or whatever. Um, I think I've heard that um, occasionally there's bugs in there and people flash it and exploit it. So that's uh, what a lot of people call local attestation where um, if the BIOS or early boot code changes, uh, the TPM will just deny you access to the secret to decrypt the hard disk. And we have actually running code for that. So um, there's been a proof of concept implementation of this whole thing. And at the bottom here, you see like my, um, from this desktop, the way it looks. So the only thing that we changed at that time was Basically, to the Lux format, you just ash, uh, add the dash dash TPM parameter. It's easy. Mm, okay. Um, so I think it's that was pretty easy, and we defined a new key slot type. And there's like on Lux two, um, we actually have JSON on our hard disk. I didn't know that. 
but uh, that's pretty cool because it's easily extendable. So there's this new key slot type that we defined that um, tells crypt setup or lib crypt setup where on the TPM to find the disk encryption secret and uh, whether it's bound to PCR state, whether it's not bound, whether it's dictionary attack protected or not. Um, so the, the essential information. And then you could just lux open it without doing anything, without having to add any parameter. So this was the, the proof of concept for this whole thing. And then talking with the maintainer, with Milan on that um, stuff, we're now gonna be re-architecting this whole thing, or he's gonna do, I think they have a lifting on the re-architecting thing and making crypt set up uh, module aware and having TPM be one of the main modules. So hopefully for 2.3 or 2.4 release, we will see this uh, on upstream and uh, ready to use for everyone. All right, uh, well, what's missing? Um, there's this whole field of attestation. As I said, I'm not gonna touch that because I think there's so many simpler things that would increment um, or increase the security much easier and much faster. Um, for example, um, 802.1x capabilities just using identity secrets in the TPM in order to authenticate for network access. I would love to see that in Network Manager or SystemD Network Key. I would love to have my GNOME key ring or K wallet um, backed by the TPM so you cannot just copy over the file and, I don't know, decrypt it somewhere else. Um, I already mentioned WireGuard and Tink. I would love to have GNU-PG support the TPM. Unfortunately, they don't have a PKCS11 backend interface. Otherwise, we could just plug it in. But I would love to see that supported because currently I'm like working on this whole TPM stuff and whenever I do a release, I have to like go ahead and use a software token, which is kind of frustrating. Um, and as I mentioned, I would love to have a second maintainer for the OpenSSL engine with more knowledge of OpenSSL than myself because I've been in too many areas to dive deep into, uh, dive too deep into the, uh, too deep into this thing. So, um, what do I want from you all? Uh, or all y'all. Um, <laughs> help to spread the TPM support into the whole core infrastructure, which is something that uh, will, I don't know, like for the greater good of the world, just make everything more secure and convenient, I don't know. Um, the areas where this is of interest is basically everywhere. I've personally worked on, on projects to integrate stuff into desktop, into server, into network equipment, into automotive, into railway controllers. We have a proof of concept research work where, um, well, currently they don't have any security, so it would be nice to have some security and why not go for TPM directly. Um, seen that in energy and IoT everywhere. And at least for the desktop server market, um, the TPM is already there. So why not um, make Linux be able to utilize the capabilities of your platform um, to all extent? Um, well, what would you need to do if you were interested in, in helping out with that? Basically, just take any of those examples and copy or in a step-by-step -step guide, um, you identify the cryptographic operations that your software does you come up with uh, a key storage scheme, whether you wanna have it persistent in the TPM, uh, so you have access during very, very early boot, or whether you wanna have the TSS manage your key store for you, or whether you wanna have your own key store with PEM files with certain headers and stuff like that. Then you think of your access control scheme. Do you wanna have it just bound to the device, as I mentioned, for data centers or embedded systems? Do you wanna have it password protected, similar to the whole PKCS11 scheme? Or do you want to have more policies such as, I don't know, local attestation or you can even have expiration time on keys on the TPM where after a certain runtime of the TPM, it will um, cease allowing access to that, key, uh, to that key, which is kind of cool. Um, and then you implement the crypto. And if that sounds complicated, just come talk to me in the hallway tomorrow at the TPM secure boot session or drop me an email or whatever and I would love to help you. Um, what would this look like? Just to give you a very, very slight impression. I know this is code, this is scary. Um, if, if or once Taffy comes out, um, enabling your software to do a signature using the, a TSS managed key will be as simple as those two lines of code. So I'm literally speaking of two lines of code in order to enable TPM support in your software. 
Um, if you want to have more control and a direct interaction with the TPM, then you would go for ESYS, and there it would be, well, four lines of code plus a bunch of variable declarations beforehand. But that's actually it in the end as well. Um, this is what it looks like in practice. So this is taken directly from the OpenSSL engine. The OpenSSL rand functions um, just call get random repeatedly until you have enough random data collected as the user requested. Or here we have, well, encapsulated in a TPM key. And then this is the decryption call. And uh, I would recommend highly to just look at that code, copy it wherever you can. Um, it's BSD three clause, I think. So it's as liberal as it gets, I guess. All right, and um, that was a little faster than expected, but that gives us more time for questions. Uh, so you mentioned BitLocker type unlock stuff. Uh, so there are various circumstances under which the PCRs that you seal and unlock key to can change. For instance, uh, firmware updates, bootloader upgrades, or depending on policy, or DVX updates if you're just using PCR7. Yeah. Are you looking at any kind of integrated infrastructure for calculating expected PCR values and automatically resealing stuff when relevant updates occur? Um, that's a I would love to integrate this stuff. And I know that there are some works of yours, some works of Philip's. Um, Come to my talk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yep, um, for example. Um, this whole pre-calculation is a big problem. So the way that uh, currently the idea for the crypt setup integration is, you would have some kind of backup key slot, a key slot with a long password <laughs> that you put into a safe somewhere. And once you do an update to any of your early boot components, you basically reboot the system, enter the long freaking password, you delete the old key slot, you recreate the key slot with a TPM and you're done. So that would be one practical workflow without having to build up, um, I don't know, uh, a few hundred thousand lines of code of infrastructure beforehand. That, like, on a practical basis, that doesn't work at all because nobody remembers what the passphrase is or realizes why, why it's important. And when they do a firmware update, their, their machines break. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but it's the only solution that's currently implemented. Um, in order to go any further, I think we need a lot of what Phil's going to be talking about tomorrow and um, especially support from distros because the only way for you to predict the PCRs for the next reboot after the update is if you know those in advance. Yeah. So you need a way to incorporate <laughs> to, to incorporate the whole uh, the whole stuff and the whole scheme into um, into your update manager, and then you can pre-calculate for the next boot and that's so on, and yeah, you take that, it from that's there. That's why we have the we have put the hashes for firmware stuff as a field in LVFS. Sorry, we put that as a field in LVFS for firmware updates, so you can actually have that data on the new firmware that you're getting. Perfect. And I think Microsoft's going to require it in their in files, which will help us a lot. Even better. While you're asking, answering other questions, could you switch to the previous slide, please? OK, then meanwhile, uh, does it look like you're getting random data from the TPM? Yes. Uh, why? How are they more random than anything else? Or are they? Well, they, uh, I don't know how much more random. They are uh, CCAEAL4 plus certified random. If that means anything to you, I don't know. <laughs> and other than that, uh, the nice thing about random data is the more random data you collect and hash together in your as a seed, the more random it is in the end because, uh, well, entropy increases the more you collect. Okay. So you basically think that do you believe they will be r more random to collect the data from the TPM? No, you take, uh, I would say, go ahead, take random data from the TPM, take random data from your CPU, take random data from your network card, and throw that all together into an entropy pool. Yeah, but I'm not asking, I'm asking about what I see on the slide. So you think it might make sense to get them from TPM? Yeah, okay. sure, as one of the sources. Okay, um, next question here. Yeah. Um, 
as far as I understand, Windows 10 takes the ownership of TPM. And if you have a dual boot machine and you want to seal your own secrets, is it possible to use TPM from Linux for like the uh, crypt setup encryption whilst not breaking BitLocker for that to continue to work as well? Well, thankfully the, or for better or worse, I should probably say the term ownership is not a TPM term in the in the in the in, in the sense that it was with 1.2 types. Um, uh, right now, what you have is you have a privacy administrator, you have the owner or storage um, um, own, um, administrator, you have the platform admi uh, the platform hierarchy, which is controlled by the BIOS, and you have the lockout authority. And taking ownership of the TPM mean, can mean any of those. Mm -hmm. um, the most important one is, I guess, definitely setting the logout auth um, because that's uh, the authorization that can be used to reset the um, dictionary attack counters. Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, I guess it's not too much of a problem. Um, usually, you would probably also want to protect your endorsement hierarchy, so the privacy um, aspects of the TPM. Um, again, this is not a problem for us to store stuff on the NV space of the TPM. So what remains is the storage hierarchy. So far, I've only seen people use uh, null auth for the storage hierarchy, thankfully. But um, we're also following the, the TCG guidance on, what is it called, EK certificate and the TPM provisioning guidance documents. And um, those basically more or less reflect what also Microsoft is doing on Windows. So um, we want to be able to support that definitely. What you will not have pr most probably is um, easy interchangeability of key formats unless you're using this TSS on Windows as well. Um, yeah. So. So on uh, Windows, there's actually a concept uh, to be able to disable BitLocker. And some of the firmware upgrading tools on Windows will, uh, with the correct administrative rights, disable BitLocker so that you'll come back and you'll be able to reseal it properly uh, the next time you boot. Have you thought of looking at anything similar with Crypt Setup? Basically, that's what currently is supported. We, what you can do is you reboot, well, you can, you can add a key slot to Lux uh, with another password, do a reboot, and somehow tell initRD to then, after the reboot, create a new key slot with a TPM binding and remove the key slot with a, null uh, with a null password and the old one. So that would be totally possible. It's merely a matter of uh, adding a 10-line script to initRD, I guess. Well, and getting all the distros to adopt that, I guess. I think a lot of this stuff is, like, I don't know how many initRD systems we currently have and how many more are currently in the plannings. Oh, six? <laughs> Eight. Eight. <laughs> nice. Uh, how many more are in the planning? Yeah, okay, so we're up to ten. So we're up to ten. I think. <laughs> so I think I think that's the big issue here. Um, we need to be able to somehow I don't know. Uh, so I'm trying to do it at uh, like upstream first, uh, enabling crypt setup to uh, or libcrypt setup to have the capability to begin with, and then we can think about how this can trickle down into I don't know system D into drug code into update and so on and so on and so on. And so on. Uh, maybe have a grub module for crypt setup I, um, with TPM support. I don't know. <laughs> cool. Yep. Well, you only need to add libjsonc and then you're fine, I guess. So one more thing to mention. Uh, uh, there was a mention that there was PCR0 field on LVFS, and that's true, but there is actually multiple PCR0 values you can have for a given machine. Uh, depending on the ME or depending on certain SKUs. So it's going to be very difficult to predictably build PCR0 unless you knew all those details. I would, I would currently be most uh, al already happy, I guess, if um, someone would come up with correct schemes and correct scripts to uh, integrate a kernel update into the pre-calculation of the PCR measurements to do the resealing um, of those values. I think that's like, at least for me, like uh, I go from the later stages to the earlier stages of the boot chain. But uh, I guess we can come from both ends and meet in the middle. Yeah. 
the, the ability to actually read the log correctly is, is new in 5.3, so like yep. that's, I know the, it hasn't uh, had a lot of time yet. <laughs> yep. Messy with patch, right? Amongst others. Amongst others. All right, I guess it's uh, three minutes left, so talk to me outside.